This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, tonight, we are going to hear from Staff Sergeant Tre Trevor Sturgill. I just, I don't know why I'm struggling to say that tonight. <laughs> yeah, from the US Army. I look forward to introducing you to him here in just a few moments. Please note that tonight's presentation will be recorded. While everyone's logging on, I want to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Ashley Pichard, and I'm the Program Relations Specialist here at Practice Match. Before joining Practice Match, I was an in-house physician recruiter, and in that role, I developed a true passion for helping physicians in their journey from training to employment. With Practice Match, I get to take that passion to the next level by offering career guidance and mentorship to physicians for medical students preparing to apply to residency, all the way through helping residents and fellows find their dream job. Hopefully, since you're here tonight, you already know about Practice Match and all that we have to offer physicians, and you're coming over from the career fair. Um, but if not, I want to highlight a few of the resources my team and I have available to you to make sure that you're getting the most out of your Practice Match experience. Um, so first, we have a free CV, CV builder and free expert CV review. We have scholarships. We have a job board where you can see job postings and filter them by specialty, geographic location, visa status, student loan repayment, and more. And if you find yourself interested in tonight's content, you can all also find the Army's job postings on our job board. We have virtual career fairs to connect you with employers, hiring in your specialty. You can earn additional revenue during training for attending them, and you can earn even more additional revenue by becoming a physician promoter and encouraging your colleagues to attend. We have monthly webinars on very various topics regarding training, interview preparation, contract negotiation, immigration assistance, loan repayment, and more. We have a free physician immigration handbook provided by Siskin and Susser, a practice path career guidebook that walks physicians through the job application process. And we also have a network of experts in just about every physician facing industry. So if you ever have a question related to career guidance, you can reach out to Practice Match and we will be happy to guide you. If you have questions about any of the things that I mentioned above, please feel free to reach out to me by replying to the webinar registration email that I sent you. Please note that that will be muted throughout the presentation. We will have time for a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions related tonight's top, to tonight's topic, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A box. He is going to be monitoring that throughout. So anytime a question comes to mind, please feel free to enter it in there and we'll get it answered as soon as possible. All right, now let's learn more about the benefits of being an Army physician. This is something that I've been curious about since I came into this role and I'm excited to learn more about, about it. At this time, I'd like to introduce Staff Sergeant Trevor Sturgill. I still can't say it, so sorry. <laughs> no, thank you, Ashley. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Staff Sergeant Trevor Sturgill. I'm with the 6th Medical Recruiting Battalion out of Las Vegas, Nevada for the U U.S. Army. Um, give me one second. Let me share my presentation. Are you, are you able to see that, Ashley? I can see it. I do see your presenter view. If you hit start okay. slideshow, that will probably make that go away. I appreciate it. Better? Perfect. All right. Thank you. So today I'll be talking about the Army Medicine and what opportunities that we, we currently offer for all physicians who are interested in serving in the Army. Uh, before I go into the specific programs, a little bit about myself. Um, I came into the Army in 2008. I have 14 years of service. And when I initially joined the Army, I was an airborne infantryman. So kind of jumping out of uh, jumping out of airplanes and a lot of deployments. Uh, in 2012, I became an Army recruiter, uh, not specifically for medical, 
but pretty much all enlisted uh, military occupational specialties. And then in 2017, uh, I became a medical recruiter. So a little over five years of actual healthcare career counseling. Uh, the 6th Medical Recruiting Battalion area of responsibility covers all the way from Hawaii to Alaska and to the Rockies. So pretty much the entire West Coast we cover. Uh, I am in charge of the virtual recruiting station. So I monitor all the Doximity, Facebook, all the social media. And then also I attend all the career fairs. And also I am in charge of all the job postings that you see online. Uh, over my five years as a healthcare recruiter, I've recruited over 200 uh, professional uh, healthcare professionals and physicians. The first program that I'll be discussing today is the financial assistant program. So I've kind of tailored all these programs to uh, the majority of physicians who are still attending residency. However, I know there may be a few of you who are already practicing, and I will save what specific programs we have to offer for you uh, at the very end. So the financial assistance program is open to all physicians during residency training. Typically, they'd like for you to have already completed your, uh, first, your first residency year. However, they do uh, grant exceptions to policies for those still attending or still completing residency in that first year. Uh, the active duty obligation is two years at a minimum. Uh, plus one half year for each additional one half year. So for every six months that you receive, uh, that you do the program is another six months that you'll serve in active duty. Uh, this program does provide a $45,000 uh, $45, bonus uh, for joining. And again, it's for anybody currently, currently completing their residency and not have finished yet. Uh, individuals must be US citizens to be eligible. And the next program I'll be talking about is the Specialized Training Assistant Program or the STRAT program. This program is a U.S. Army Reserve program. So unlike the other one where your active duty obligation would be, you know, serving full time at a military installation, this program is for those who would be looking more at a, a part time military career. So you could still, you know, have your own civilian practice. Uh, or whatever civilian full-time job you may have. And then this would be uh, served one week in a month, two weeks out of the year. Uh, for this program, you'd incur a one-year obligation in the Army Reserves for every six months or portion thereof for financial assistance. So what that means is basically uh, for this program, you don't have to take like a set number of years that you want the stipend. So if you're in your third year of residency and it's a five-year resident residency program, then you could take the stipend for two years and then your payback would be four years in the Army Reserves. But again, that time would be part-time, so it's only one week in a month, uh, two weeks out of the year. After residency, uh, you would serve in the Army Reserves either, either at a TPU, which is what most people think of when they think of the normal Army Reserve um, unit. Like it's a, unit located you know all over they're located all over the u.s and you would go you would drive to that location and you would do your drill that weekend and then you you know you drive back home typically though if that unit doesn't have a vacancy for your specific specialty then we can place you in what's called the apmc which is the amed professional management command and what this is is basically it is a remote command that allows you to serve in the army reserves despite you know, there may not be an Army Reserve local unit near you. So you would still be able to do your drill and everything remotely, um, either by driving to a unit where you're not actually assigned to, but then you're managed by the APMC. And for this program, you also must be a US citizen. The HPLRP or the Health Profession Loan Repayment Program is a program that uh, will repay any qualified loans from a lending institutions annually for three years. So if you join for, uh, you know, three years of active duty, then basically those loans would be paid annually over the course of three years. 
the active duty obligation consists of a minimum of two years and they must be served consecutively. And then for the Army Reserve uh, Student Health Loan Repayment Program, uh, it's also a repayment of uh, qualified loans, but you must serve in an uh, Army Reserve TPU, which is a local unit, or the APMC uh, while you're uh, serving your time for the obligation for the loan. Uh, individuals may be eligible to apply for other AR incentives. So you could do the STRAT program, which is the monthly stipend of, um, it's roughly, it's over $2,600 a month, basically is what you would be receiving uh, while attending residency if you did the STRAT program. And you could also apply for the health profession loan repayment program that would also pay back your loans after school. So to give you an example scenario of what it would look like. So if you're, you know, your second year resident, uh, you have three years to go. You can do the stipend for those three years you have remaining, which would be a six year army reserve obligation. But then if you decided that you also wanted to do the health professional loan repayment program for, you know, annually two years. So you, you know, you would get that amount for the two years afterwards. You would tag that obligation on to the end of your strap obligation. So you would have six years in the Army Reserves once you completed residency. And then you would have another two years of uh, Army Reserve obligation at the end of that. So total, you would be looking at eight years to try to simplify that for you. That's all that I had listed, but I, I do want to discuss um, for those who are already who may already be practicing. Uh, we actually have what's called the critical wartime shortage accessions bonus. Basically, this is uh, calculated by Congress uh, annually for specific specialties that are critical wartime shortage uh, specialties. Basically, this gives you a session bonus anywhere up to $400,000 for a three or four year contract. So those of you who are already practicing, who would not be eligible for the financial assistance program or the STRAT program, would be able to apply for an accession bonus for, you know, a three year or four year active duty obligation. So you could get, you know, up to $400,000 and you would have a commitment of four years uh, working full-time at a military installation. Some of the processes for, if you decided that um, you would like to serve as a physician in the Army, basically there's three big things that we have to do during your application. Number one is the application itself. Uh, it's it's kind of lengthy. Uh, a local healthcare recruiter would help you through that process and kind of show you how to fill it out. Uh, a lot of it is employment history, resi uh, residences, you know, education, all the basic information, you know, that you would see on application. But then also we do require a physical. Uh, the physical was done either at a military treatment facility or at a military entrance processing station or MEPS uh, as they call it. But basically this could consist of you going to a um, chief medical officer and then performing a physical just to make sure, you know, that you're healthy, um, that you don't have any major issues that could uh, deter you from being able to complete, you know, the Army combat fitness test or, you know, any routine PT. And then after that, we also do require a CV uh, review, or basically where we take your CV, uh, all your licenses, all your uh, educational transcripts, any certifications that you may have. Uh, we also collect letters of recommendation, a statement of motivation, and pretty much we submit all this up to a program manager for the medical corps who then reviews it and based on, you know, what experience you have, what education level you're at and everything, they would determine your rank. Uh, normally for someone just coming out of med school uh, and starting residency, they come in as a captain, which is an 03. So that's what your pay would be based on is what rank you come in as. So the more experience, you know, we've had uh, general surgeons uh, come in as lieutenant colonels sometimes, uh, you know, if they have 10 to 20 years of experience. So all that is done uh, when we do your CV request. 
Um, normally, the the time frame that we like to give physicians whenever they're applying is anywhere from nine to 12 months. Uh, the process can take, and again, that is because you are being commissioned as an Army medical officer. Uh, it's not like a normal enlistment. So uh, that has to be approved by Congress. So it can take, you know, it can take quite a while. So normally, you know, just to, to establish the timeline up front, we normally tell everybody, you know, nine to 12 months is, is the average time that it could take. Uh, that is all I have for right now. I'll pause at this time to take any questions. All right, so I'm listening to your onboarding and quite honestly, it doesn't sound too far off um, from the process of if you were getting a job in the civilian world, as I mentioned, I used to be an in-house recruiter. Contracts could easily take up to six months from the time we interviewed someone to the time they were signed. Uh, and then as far as like onboarding and the things they would have to do, they would stop to do the physical. We were definitely checking all those credentials on the CV as well. So as I'm looking at like, in my mind, my, my first question when I start thinking about army physician is like, what's the pros and cons? How do you weigh that um, between, you know, deciding if you're going to apply for civilian world or if you want to participate in this. So I don't see credentialing is, you know, too far off. What else would you say would be like pros What's, what's the pro con list here? What do people quickly get to when they start weighing civilian versus army? So normally I would say the, the biggest pros obviously are so for, and again, it can differ a lot between active duty, full-time and part-time army reserves, but a lot of the benefits, number one is full medical, full dental. Uh, and that also includes your family. If, you know, if you're married and you have children, uh, the entire family gets full medical and full dental. And then you get 30 days paid travel vacation a year annually. Um, you also get um, with active duty, again, the student loan repayment, uh, which I already discussed. And normally that, that's uh, set at 120000 So for three years, you're looking at $40,000 a year for that. But also just the ability to, you know, travel, but also unlike a civilian, uh, unlike the civilian sector in the military, you're a medical officer. However, you're also an officer. And with that comes leadership. So, you know, you may be a, you know, a critical care nurse. However, you could be in charge of, you know, an entire clinic. Or, you know, you could be a anesthesiologist and you could be in charge in charge of the entire Pacific command, um, you know, overseas. So that's kind of where the big difference between the civilian sector and the, you know, uh, career in the army is that leadership aspect that you would not get in the civilian sector. Uh, because even starting out, you know, you would go to the captain's career course and the military would send you to a lot of different uh, leadership schools, you know, the, the military war college. So that's the big, I would say the big, you know, difference when it comes to civilian versus, versus army. However, that can also be a con. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I hear, you know, is the aspect of, you know, fear of deployment or, you know, they don't, people don't like being uprooted. So, with that travel and, you know, the aspect of leadership, you kind of get the pro and the con because you can, you know, yes, you can be in charge of the Pacific command overseas. However, then, you know, you would be overseas. So having to travel a lot. So some people, uh, I do know that that can be a deterrent to some people, which I understand, but I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons, especially when you look at, you know, service to country and then also, being able to, you know, your patient population is one of the best in the country. Obviously, you know, the majority of soldiers are made up of 18 to, you know, 35 year old, uh, typically healthy um, males and females. So your patient population uh, is typically, you know, already pretty healthy and they're required to you know, to see you annually. So it, it, they can't, 
you know, just ignore healthcare. So a lot of them actually take it serious. And uh, I know a lot of physicians, that is the biggest reason they stay is because they absolutely love the patients that they see. I hope that answered your question, Ashley. Yes, excellent information. It sounds like there are a lot of perks and like it's also very rewarding. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, looking down, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, we have a quiet group tonight. If any of you decide that you do have questions or you want to ask a question that's specific to your specialty or special circumstances, please feel free to reach out to Staff Sergeant Sergeant Sturgill, his information is right here on the screen for you. And thank you so much for your time, Staff Sergeant Sturgill. This has been really educational. Thank you all for attending as well. Um, if you have enjoyed this webinar, we do have more coming up. On August 16th, we have Physician Immigration Green Card green card options for physicians. And September 6th, we have salary data and contract review tips. We hope to see you there. Good night, everyone.